come together here this evening. We thank you for your Sabbath as we have been studying and understanding the context of it historically and biblically and understanding, Lord, that you have set this day aside as a very special day. And Lord, you have revealed in your word that the evening and the morning makes up a day in regards to your original timing. And so, Lord, even as the sun is setting and we get into this session, we want to thank you for your Sabbath. We want to thank you for the new week that is beginning. And, Lord, we want to thank you that we can open your word so freely and understand it that much more again tonight. Please bless our speaker. Please bless everyone that is here, Lord. Bless us, be protected, and help us and speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, now, this evening, we have another concordance to give away. And uh, I know that we've uh, been able to bless a number of different people. Boy, we wish we had another, enough concordances to give to everybody, uh, but we just don't. So tonight, we're going to give the, the concordance to another couple that has been coming on a regular basis. Their names are Kim and Scott Davidson. So let's give them a round of applause as we send that home with them here this evening. Congratulations. Yeah. We're all going to stand and greet each other and give each other a big smile. Welcome them to the meetings. And introduce yourself if you haven't already. <laughs> good to see you. I don't want to talk to you because you called me. Okay. Hi, Maria. Oh, did I leave a message? Oh, okay. But we never talked yet. All right, tonight we're going to stay standing, and we are going to sing I Surrender All. Is that right? I Surrender All. Let's sing it from our hearts. Jesus. 
please be seated. And so with surrender to our heart, we want to, to the Lord, we want to thank you, Carlos, for another presentation tonight. Two, one, two. One, two, one, two. You hear me? Got me? Yes? No? Maybe so? All right. Maranata. Welcome, everybody. I look like the President of the United States today. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Woo! Welcome to another presentation, my loved ones, of Unveiling Revelation. Your life is about to change forever. And things, I mean, things have with the roller coaster has really started, amen? And so, praise the Lord for the things that Scripture is revealing to us as God prepares us, and tonight is not an exception. So, let's do a little run-by. Remember, next week, you're going to receive... Our guests are going to receive the Daniel and Revelation magazine. Some of you have asked me about some parts of Revelation that uh, if we're going to cover it, and we're not going to cover the whole thing because of time. I'm just covering like the major themes that are happening relevant to our times. But this Daniel and Revelation magazine you're going to receive covers all of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. The whole book, it breaks down the schemes, a lot of things. So you will really enjoy that gift we're going to give you next week. So you don't want to miss out on that one. Amen? I want to remind you tomorrow we're going to be here at 7 o'clock, Babylon's Buffet. Eating and drinking in the times of Noah. Jesus Christ warns us. He says, as it was in the times of Noah, Matthew chapter 24, so shall it be before I return. And he says that they were doing what? They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage. So we're going to talk about what is, it, what is happening because there's nothing wrong with eating and drinking. That's part of human life, right? But something is happening with eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage in the times of Noah that we have to study because that's the warning that Jesus says. When you see this happening, what? Then watch out, right? Get in the ark. So this is very important study in regards to our preparation for the things that are going to be coming forward. So that's going to be Sunday at 7 o'clock. Then we have Thursday. Remember, we'll be back Thursday. Marriage in the times of Noah because they were marrying and giving into marriage. What's going on with this? Oh, that's the surprise. You need to come because we need to study and see what is happening during the times of Noah before the flood that he's speaking to us. Because remember, I mentioned to you that He's speaking to the church, right? We sometimes apply these verses to those that are on the outside of church, but no, he's speaking to God's children, right? So everybody that considers themselves to be children of God, part of God's people, amen? Then we come back next Friday, February 14th. So if you're in the loving mood, well, come here because we're going to talk about the bride of Christ, right? Two women that want to be the bride of Christ, but only one of them can be. It's a wonderful, amazing, one of my favorite studies. We're going to look at about two or three different prophecies uh, time prophecies too in this wonderful presentation. Then we come back like we did today. Today we have a what? We had a triple header, right? We had one presentation this Sabbath morning and then we had two today, right? So next Sabbath, because it's going to be our last one, we're going to have a quadruple header. So we're going to start first at 9.30, right? Building your tolerance and your endurance. 9.30, the Battle of Armageddon and the Seven Final Plagues. Part number... One. So we're going to first study that topic, right? It's about a 45-minute topic. And then we're going to have a little break. And then we're going to do the, next, the second one, the Battle of Armageddon and the seven, pli seven Final Plagues, part number two. So that's going to be next Sabbath morning. So we're going to have a doubleheader. So you have plenty of time to rest from Monday to Wednesday as we get started. And if you're like, I'm tired, so am I. So don't worry about it, right? <laughs> you're just sitting down there. I'm the one actually doing uh, all the movement up here, but that's okay. And so then, what well, remember, we'll have lunch, right? There'll be a lunch, like we did today. Who enjoyed lunch today? Who enjoyed lunch today? Very good. Amen. Awesome. And then we come back for 530, the 144,000 and the victory over sin. Amen? We've been delving. We've been putting together this concept of the 144,000. We're going to seal the deal on next Sabbath afternoon, 530, the 144,000 and the victory over sin, the experience of those that will be standing. And then we finished at 7 o'clock with the last presentation, the millennium and the keys to the bottomless pit. Revelation chapter 20 says that the devil will be tied down, chained down in this bottomless pit for a thousand years, right? So we're going to study what happens before the thousand years, what happens during the thousand years, and what happens after the thousand years. Another topic that, or another title that I give this presentation is the millennium and your eternal vacation. Woo! Right? So we'll be talking about this. This will be our last presentation for the seminar, but it's not going to be the end of us studying together. Amen? And so next week, I'll give you more information what we're going to happen the following week. Who says amen to that? Amen. 
Amen? Okay, so that's what we have, my loved ones. Tonight, Amazing Facts presents the image of the beast. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for bringing us back this afternoon. We were here this morning, Father, had a wonderful Sabbath service. We talked about the mark of the beast, and today, Father, now we are going to study the image of the beast. So we ask you, Father, that you continue to guide us, strengthen us, be with us as we continue to unravel, to, to unlock these mysteries that are in Scripture through your Holy Spirit and through your Word. Thank you for this blessing again, Father, for giving us this opportunity to come together. And we ask and beg these things in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Go with me, please, to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. In Revelation chapter 14, we have the everlasting gospel, right? We've been studying this message during these, these this is our fourth week. Next week will be our fifth week. We've been studying this message, this last message, God's last warning to the earth, the everlasting gospel, Revelation chapter 14, verse number 6, right? And so please join me in verse number 9, Revelation chapter 14, verse number 9. Everybody there? Look at what it says. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 9. This is the third angel's message. Then a third angel follows them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone what? Worships. What's the synonym for worshiping? Obedience. If anybody worships or obeys the beast, we've identified, and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Right? The last warning. And so we have already identified this beast power. This morning we talked about the mark of the beast. And these themes will continue to develop during going into next week as we go into the battle of Armageddon and how this is all coming together. Right? We're taking these elements. We're explaining them. And then we're going to put them together and see how this all uh, comes together, how it all breaks down. Now, the question is on what? The image of the beast. The beast has an image. Go with me, please, to the book of Daniel. Go with me to the book of Daniel, please. The book of Daniel. We're going to go to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Watch this. Remember, when John writes Revelation, he is using events, people, places that literally took place in the Old Testament, right? Events that happen literally in literal places on a local level. And he's taking these events and these places and these, these, uh, and these people and names. And he's applying them in the end times, but not li- locally, but on a worldwide level, right? So when it says the image of the beast, to know where does God, John get the foundation of what he's talking about in the image of the beast, we need to go to Daniel chapter 3 because this is where the issue comes up. Everybody there? So, verse... Daniel chapter 3, verse number 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king. The king of who? Babylon. Babylon. Are we not warned about Babylon in Revelation? Yes. So Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, made it what? An image of gold whose weight was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word together... To, to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the what? Of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, and Nebuchadnezzar lifted up this great image, right? This statue, this idol. And he said what? Come to the what? Come to the dedication. So it was kind of like, let's say, for example, if let's say uh, the local governor, who's the governor of California? News, Gavin Newsom. Okay, let's say Gavin Newsom, let's say he builds a statue, right? And he builds a statue. He says, hey, all the, everybody that works for the government, you know, city council, state officials, you know, we're going to dedicate this image, this statue, this coming Monday. And so everybody's going to get off of work and everybody, I want you to show up to the inauguration or the dedication. Is everybody with me? Something like that, right? Let's continue. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrate, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried out, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and... Have we seen that phrase before in Revelation? All nations, tribes, tongues, and people. So it wasn't only the officials of the government... Everybody was invited to the dedication. And if the king told you to come, you you go. And it says that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the 
Lyrie? How do you say that? Yeah, we don't even know, right? Okay. <laughs> Lear and sal psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and what? Well, I thought it was a dedication. What started as an inauguration dedication ended up as a worship service. So everybody was what? Deceived, right? They're thinking, we're just going to go to dedication. Yeah, you know, they'll have maybe some, some food, some high, we'll hang out, and then we'll go home. And they ended up in a worship service. And worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not, what? Fall or kneel down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So, that's exactly what's happening in Revelation. Go with me now. We'll finish this story next week. Revelation chapter 13. Watch this. We're going to finish that story next week. We're setting the groundwork for what is the image. I showed you now where the concept comes from. And watch how this is repeated in Revelation chapter 13. When you're there, say amen. amen. Verse number 14. Revelation chapter 13, verse number 14. And it says, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make what? To make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and live. He was granted to give power to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be what? To be killed. So, same concept, right? Nebuchadnezzar rises up an image. He says, everybody bow down and worship the image. And if you do not, you're going to be thrown where? Into the furnace of fire. That same example we take then, we see in Revelation where John says the same thing is going to happen in the end. The beast Babylon is going to lift up an image again. And those who do not bow down and obey and worship this image shall be what? Shall receive a death sentence. Is everybody following me up to now, my loved ones? So as we talk about this beast power, we already talked about this, right? This beast power being this nation, this kingdom, the... The Vatican. Now, if it's the first time that you're here tonight and you have not been during the rest of this presentation, we've been talking about this for a long time already. We've been breaking this down and studying in detail. So we have the Bible lessons out in front, or I send you all of my notes with all of the resources that we study this. So I don't want anybody here to think if this is your first night that in any way, shape, or form we're being disrespectful or we're looking down or talking down to Catholics, right? As I mentioned, we're not talking about Catholics when we're talking about the Vatican, right? Catholics in their majority are just people that love the Lord and serve the Lord based on what they know, how they were raised, right? Sincere, God-loving people, amen? Can we agree with that, amen? Like in all churches, in all denominations, in every church, everywhere, God has his children everywhere scattered around. Who says amen to that? Amen? But we are talking about the institution, about the practices, the teachings, and the doctrines that sadly Scripture teaches have been a distortion, a perversion of Scripture. And that's where our battle is. Our battle is not against humans. Our battle and our war is against truth and falsehoods and perversions to Scripture. Amen? And so that's what God has called us to clarify. And that's why, sadly, we don't do it because, it, we, because it think it's fun. We do it because that's where Scripture points. All of the evidence points to the same place. And so the beast of Revelation, as we know, that beast of this nation is the Vatican. And this little horn king, this antichrist power, is the is the papacy, right? The office of the papacy. And so this is what scripture is talking about. Again, we're not talking about people. We're talking about the institution, the teachings, the practices. Is everybody with me? Now, to understand the image of the beast, we need to start from the beginning of chapter 13. So go with me back to verse 1. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. We need to go back to the beginning. Revelation chapter 13. Everybody there? says, then I stood on the sand of the sea. What does the sea represent? Let's see all of you who have been studying for four weeks. What does the sea represent? People, nations, tribes, tongues, right? And I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw what? A beast. What is a beast in prophecy, my loved ones, biblically? Nation, right? A nation, a kingdom. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. Let's see, what do the seven heads represent? Who remembers? Seven hills, right? The seven hills, Rome is known as the city on seven hills. Ten horns, ten horns was the, after the fall of the Roman Empire, right? The Roman Empire fell apart and it debacled and it turned into how many nations? Ten nations. And on his horn, ten what? Crowns. If they're crowns, what does that imply? They are what? 
kingdoms, monarchies, right? Is that not the case after the Roman Empire fell down? That these kingdoms rose up, right? France and all of these other nations? Yes. And it says in verse number, uh, same verse. And on his head were a blasphemous name. We talked about the blasphemous name, right? Uh, Vicario Filidei, when they say call me my holiness, all of these names that imply that he is God on earth. That's why he is known as the Antichrist. Verse 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So who gives the power to the beast? China? Who's the dragon? The enemy, right? Why? Because the enemy does not want anybody to be saved. So the enemy then to trample on, to obscure, to confuse the pathway to salvation, to restore or to once again live in the presence of God, he sadly uses this system to deviate, to confuse, and to distort Truth, Bible truth, amen? Praise the Lord for the Bible that we are not confused, amen? We can come to scripture and God reveals it and shows it to us. It continues to say, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been what? Mortally wound. So one of those heads, right? In this context, the little horn received this mortal wound, right? The papacy received the mortal wound. Does anybody remember what year it happened? 1798, very good, we'll see that in a second. The mortal wound, and remember, the deadly wound mean that, it, that they lost what? They lost their political power, right? They lost their political power because they were using both swords, and so the deadly wounds means that that civil political power was lost. We're just reviewing what we studied last week. And the deadly wound was what? So if the deadly wound implied, we studied last week, Losing political power, that means that if the wound is healed, that means that what is going to be restored? That political power will be restored again. And the world marveled and followed the beast. I have a question. Is the world marveled already and following the beast? Yes, yes it is. Has the power been growing and growing and growing and growing and growing? Yes it has. And some people say, oh, but what about the scandals and, the, and this child abuse and all of this? Yes, look at it like a bump in the road for them, right? They're, 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 they're planning way ahead, right? They're looking at that and they're going forth and they will overcome because Scripture says that they will be standing until the end. Verse 4. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worship the beast saying, Who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? So when you obey the beast, you are really obeying who? The devil, right? Because he's the one that's behind this system. He gave this system its power, his throne, his authority, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. What was the blasphemy? Who remembers? What is a blasphemy? Someone's a man saying that they are? Who's the only one that can do that? Jesus Christ. Amen? And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. 42 months. Who remembers what was the, uh, the, uh, the parallel to 42 months? 1,260 days. But in prophecy, a prophetic day equals a literal... So it's 1,260. Who remembers in what year did the power, this power that they received, the political power of the papacy, in what year did it begin? In the year 538, very good, with the Justinian Codus, right? When Justinian, the emperor, gives over his political power, he says, you take care of Western Europe, now it's in your hands. And so at that moment, 538, it was when the papacy joins both powers. And that's where mayhem and chaos begin, known as the Dark Ages. And so it says in Revelation... Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped around. It says in Revelation chapter 13, we were on verse number 6. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, of course, because he thinks he's God and he speaks against God and he tries to take God to blaspheme his name, commandments, his tabernacle, plan of salvation, and to those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints. War, right? The, the Inquisition, the Crusades, I mean, just, just horrific events that happened during the Dark Ages. And authority was given to him over who? Every tribe, tongue, and nation. Verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, verse 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Raise your hand if you have an ear. Okay. Raise your hand if you have two ears. So is this message for you? Is this message for me? When God says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He knows we all have ears. Are you getting me? So what is he saying? Pay attention. Watch this. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. 
And he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Now, notice this. Did the papacy take people captive during the 1,260 years? Did they use the sword, the power, the civil power to kill people? So they took captive and they killed using what? The power of state, the power of a political civil power. And it says here that because they did that, what was going to happen is that he who kills with the sword must be what? Killed with the sword and he who leads into captivity would be taken what? Taken into captivity themselves. Now, when did this happen? We already read this, the modern papacy, right? Berthier entered Rome on February 10th, 1798 and proclaimed the republic. Half of Europe then followed Napoleon and in regards to the pope, the papacy was... Dead, dead as a political power, right? Not a religious power, as a political institution. Europe was tired of the abuses and the corruption of the papacy, and they said, no more. We're tired of it. Take away their power. Nobody's going to continue to bow down to you. Nobody's going to be puppets to you anymore. And so the political power was taken away, right? See, in 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte sent his general Alejandro Bertil to Rome, and Pope Pius VI was taken, what? Captive to France where he died in exile. So this verse right here that we just read, in verse number 10, has a date. Because it says, He who leads into captivity was taken into captivity, and he who kills with the sword, what? Would receive his deadly wound and be killed with the sword. That means that, this is what I love about Revelation, and why I love Revelation so much, and oh, it's in the whole Bible, but especially Revelation, is that you can, you can tie it in with history, Amen. You can put the events places. I mean, it's not in a vacuum. God is showing us history and prophe prophecy through history, confirming the very things that we're, that we're reading and studying. So why do I say that? Because look at what it says in verse number 11. Then I saw another beast. Then, then or after. After what? 1798. Because in 1798, the papacy was taken captive and they received their mortal wound. So then it says, then, or after this, I saw another beast. That means after 1798, what happens? Let's continue to read. After this, I saw another beast coming out of what? Where did the first beast come out of? But this one's coming out of the earth. Interesting. Are you catching me, my loved ones? And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. My loved ones, we have another beast pop up in prophecy. You thought we were just going to focus on one beast. Prophecy is talking about another beast. Now, what is a beast? We know that. It is a nation. So now we have another nation rising up, not from the sea, but from the earth, right? That word in Greek, really, what it means is the, the land, the earth, the land, the, 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 I can't find the word in English. I'm thinking in my head. I, of course, I can't think anywhere else, right? But you know what I mean. <laughs> Verse 12. And he exercises all the authority of who? So they're working together. Watch this. In his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was what? Was healed. So this second beast of this second nation, guess what? He is the one that is going to give the papacy his political power back. Because it's saying that this second beast, what? He restored, he works together with her and the wound has been healed. So that's saying that this second beast is this beast or the nation that is going to give this beast, the, 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 the uh, Antichrist power, his political power back again. Watch this. And this is happening after what year? 1798. What year are we in? Okay, let's continue to read. It says in verse number, we just read 12, number 13. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. That verse 13 we're not going to study today. We're going to study that next week when we talk about the battle of Armageddon because that 13 is, a, is just too delicious. But we'll see, verse 14. And he deceives those who would, and he deceives, uh, come on, okay. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. That's the first beast, right? The second beast is doing this in combination, in collaboration with the first beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make what? 
to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So the deadly wound in verse 10 happened in 1798. And so what we're seeing is that it's saying that after 1798, some point in the future, this second beast is going to rise up and the second beast is going to what? Is going to wound the heel, is going to heal the wound, I'm sorry, of the first beast. That means he's going to give him back his political power by what? By making an image of him, right? So that image is what's going to be the representation that the wound has healed or that, once again, these powers of church and state have been united or combined. Verse number 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should what? Both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So again, this system, false system of worship is going to be restored. This joining of these political and, and religious powers are going to come together. And this false system of worship is going to be implemented, imposed, as it happened during the Dark Ages in the 1,260 years. Verse 16. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on there. So the mark of the beast is tied in directly with this image that is going to be risen up of the first beast of the papacy. And that no one may what? Buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So that means that if it's talking about buying or selling, what, uh, buying or selling, what, is, what is happening in here? Buying and selling has to do with what? Commerce, right? Transaction, money transactions, interchange of goods. That's what that is, right? Money is just a good or a representation of a good for you to interchange goods, right? Buying and selling, that means there's some type of what? There's some type of economical system going on here too that is being implemented at the same time as political and religious powers are also joining. So you have this threefold power, right? That is coming together between these two beasts that it's talking about. So the question is, how are we going to figure this out? Well, we're going to start with this. What are the characteristics of a beast in prophecy or a nation? They're not just any nation. The characteristics of a beast is a nation that dominates politically, economically, militarily, culturally, and technologically, right? This is a world superpower. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire. They were not just regional powers. They were world superpowers, as was the case of the papacy dominating at that period of time all of Europe and its colonies. So when it makes reference of a beast, it's saying that there's going to be a second nation that is going to rise up and it is going to be a world superpower and is going to dominate. Now, this is what we're going to see. The second beast of Revelation has three stages biblically proven. We're going to study them tonight. The first one is before it became a beast. The second one is when it becomes a, we a beast or a superpower, and the third one is when it makes the world worship the first beast. When it starts to collaborate and work together and it gets to a point where it says, now I'm going to give you back your political power so that you can once again be king on the earth. Is everybody with me? Now, where are we going to go? We just read the last part. That's what we basically read. Actually, part of the second and the third. So to understand this, we need to go to before it became a beast, right? Before it became a superpower, a nation. Where do we need to go? Revelation chapter 12. Go with me, please. Revelation chapter 12. I mentioned to you in the beginning of the seminar that Revelation chapter 12 is my favorite chapter in Revelation. Why? Because it's basically a summary of the Bible. It's a summary of Revelation. And so we're going to go by it verse by verse, and we're going to study it to this week and next week in more detail because there's so much. It's just so delicious that we don't have enough time. Everybody there? Revelation chapter 12, verse number 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Right? Remember, what does a woman represent in prophecy? God's people or God's church, right? The woman is clothed with the sun. Or in other words, we talked a little bit about this. She is clothed with the glory of God, right? That's what she's clothed with. She's clothed with the glory of God. With the moon under her feet. What does that mean? Well... Very simple. I have a question. Does the moon give out its own light? No. no. What light does the moon reflect off? The sun's light. So if the sun in this context is a representation of the glory of God, and the moon is reflecting off of it, that means that there is something that reflects the glory of God. And the woman is standing, that means she is founded on this moon, right? This is her, her foundation. So what does the moon represent? The word of God. Amen? 
the Word of God. The Word of God what? It reflects the glory of God. It shows us Jesus Christ. Amen? So the church is founded on what? On Scripture. Amen? Not on what a man says. Not on what a man believes. Not on so No. The church is founded on the Word of God. Who says amen to that? Amen. Continues to say in verse number 12. And with the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Right? Numbers are also have lots of uh, symbolic representation. 12 disciples. 12 tribes. Uh, uh, we have the 12 governors that Solomon planted. 12 judges. We have 24 elders. We have uh, 72 that went out. 144,000. These are all multiples of 12 and represent the leadership in the church. Amen? Now watch this. Then being with child, she cried out in labor, in, in labor and in pain to give birth. So that means that the woman was what? She's pregnant, right? She's pregnant. So she's about to give birth. Who's about to be born? The Messiah. Remember we studied Genesis chapter 3 where God says out of the woman is going to come what? The seed. You're going to give that seed a wound. You're going to really hurt him, but he's going to resurrect and he's going to put an end to your kingdom. Amen? And so this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. The seed is about to be born, is about to come forth from the woman. Verse 3. And behold, another sign appeared in heaven. What was it? A great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars, right? To the earth. How many? A third. Stars represent angels. So a third of the angels follow this dragon. It's China, right? The devil. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Let's stop right there. This is history in the making, my loved ones. So we start with Revelation chapter 12. Talks about the seven stages of the woman. How many stages? Seven. Now watch this. Seven stages of the church are explained in Revelation chapter 12. The first stage is verses 1 and 2, which is talking about God's people from the very beginning. The church, God's people from Adam until who? Until Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Because in verse 2 it says that who's about to be born? Jesus is about to be born in verse number 2. So Jesus is about to come forth. So this gives us some historical context to this verse. But then it says that who showed up? A dragon showed up and the dragon was trying to do what? To devour who? The child. Now, was the devil literally standing in front of Mary when she was about to give birth to eat Jesus Christ when he came out? No, not literally. This is symbols, right? How did the devil try to impede or avoid the birth of the Messiah? By doing what? By the massacre of Herod. Remember that? It talks very clearly when he heard that there was a prince, of, a king was born. He said, kill all babies under two years old. And so that's what it's talking about. Historical context. He tried to devour the child because the devil knew that's the one that's going to put an end to my reign. Amen? Amazing. Now, Herod was a puppet of what empire? Of the Roman Empire. Again, the devil using these, ro these world powers to try to impede the plan of salvation, to try to impede Christ's coming. And so what we have here in verses 3 and 4 is the dragon, or imperial Rome, trying to impede the birth of Christ. Everybody with me? So I'm just walking you down the scheme on this chapter. Verse number 5. Was the devil successful? Verse 5. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his? Was the devil successful, the dragon successful, in trying to impede the coming of the Messiah? No. My loved ones, verse 5 talks about the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ in one verse. All of the life of Jesus Christ from the moment he is born until the moment he ascends, Everything is recovered, is explained in that verse, number five. And the question is why? Why is it that in that one verse it talks about the whole life of Jesus from the moment he is born to the moment he rises? Very simple. Because the focus on Revelation chapter 12, my loved ones, is not on the child, it's on the woman. The focus on Revelation chapter 12 is on God's people. Are you catching me? Of course, through the history of the Messiah, through the history of Christ, but we're going to see that the whole focus of the chapter is the history of the church, of God's people from the very beginning. Are you catching me? And so we started off a, a summary, an overview of God's people in the Old Covenant, right, with God's people from Adam to Christ. Then the dragon tries to impede or tries to kill Christ, and then we see that what happens? The birth of Jesus Christ through his ascension in the year 31. That's basically 5, 7 through 11, because verse 6 there's a small parenthesis. Let's read it. 
Then the woman did what? Fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that she should feed her there for how long? 1,260 days. Have we not seen that before? Yes, that same time period, 1,260 years, that began in what year? 538 and ended in the year? Now, that was a parenthesis. If you continue to read, we're not going to do this today. Next week we'll go into it a little bit, a little bit more. Verse 7, then Jesus Christ ascends. There's a war in heaven, right? There's a battle, the serpent, salvation. Then we go back to verse number 12. Everybody there? So from verse 7 through 11, it talks about the ascension of Jesus Christ and going into heaven. I did not have a, I have a whole presentation on that. We didn't cover it because of time, but I told you I was going to send you that, and I did not. So I'll send it you to this. A study on Revelation 4 and 5, which is founded on this, what happened in heaven before, during, and after the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. I'll send you that study because of time. We're just going to focus today on the image of the beast. Let's go to verse number 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows his, he has what? Short time. So when Christ ascends in the year 31, the devil then is kicked out for a second time from heaven because he had, he had gained authority after he became the king of this earth. But then Christ, when he resurrects, he says, No, you no longer are the king or the prince of this earth. Now I am king. And so the devil has no longer authority as the representative of this earth to be in heaven. He is kicked out. When did that happen in the year? 31. Is everybody with me? But what happens then? Let's continue to read. Page keeps on jumping on me. It says in verse number 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted who? The woman. Why is he persecuting the woman? His war was against who? The child, right? But the child beat him, defeated him, ascended into heaven, and the devil is not, not what? Kicked back to the earth, and he has no authority, no power anymore. So now he's, he's back on this earth. He cannot go into heaven anymore. And now what happens? Now he's taking all of his anger out on who? On the woman, on the church, right? And so we see that the dragon or imperial Rome now focuses persecution of the church. And so I put the year 31, because that's the year that Jesus Christ ascends, to the year 538. And you're probably asking me, where did you come up with those dates? Watch this. Verse number 14. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a what? Time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So that's this, this is parallel to verse number Six, where it's saying that God protected his church, and we're going to see why. This is why this is so interesting. Because from the year 31 when Christ ascends up to the year 538, the church was persecuted by Rome. But yet, it's after that, during the 1,260 years, it says that God takes the church and puts it where? In the wilderness, and he gives a special protection that means something worse than persecution happened after the year 538. And so God then has to protect because persecution is not the problem here. Because the more you kill and the more they attack Christians, the more Christians came forth, right? And so what does the devil do? Oh, no. I see the strategy. The more I kill, the more they pop up. So now I'm going to do, I'm not going to attack the church. I'm going to infiltrate the church. And I'm going to um, erode it from within corrupt it and we know that that's what happened from 538 to 1798 right the church is protected in the wilderness from papal rome are you seeing this my loved ones again those time period 1260 year time times and half a time god put a special protection why to protect the plan of salvation because if he had not done that, if he had not given this special protection, this special care of his church during these 1,260 years, the plan of salvation would have been completely corrupted, completely diluted. And so God puts this special protection over his church during this time period. Because if not, forget it. Are you catching me? But watch what happens. Verse number 15. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Flood, waters, what do they represent? People, tribes, nations, tongue. I have a question. 
Did the papacy during the 1,260 years use the powers of Europe to try to destroy the church? Yes, he did, right? To corrupt it, destroy it, destroy everything. So what it's saying is he threw floods, waters. That means he threw everything he had, all of the political powers, all of the religious oppression, all of the distortion and corruption, the papacy, the dragon used to corrupt as much as possible. But of course, why was the church able to be sustained? Because God took care of her in the wilderness, amen? He put this special protection during this time period to uphold and sustain because the wrath of those 1,260 years would have knocked it down if it had not been for the protection of God. Amen? Verse 16. But the earth helped the woman. Who helped the woman? Ooh. Notice that after this time period, God doesn't have to protect her anymore. Why? Because the earth is helping her. The earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. In other words, during the 1,260 years, 538 to 1798, God had a special protection around his people. Amen? From the Roman, from the Roman imperial Rome and from papal Rome. But after this time period finished... God didn't have to protect her anymore because now who was protecting the church? The earth. Are you catching me? So God says, okay, now she's fine. Now she's in this place. The earth protects the church. So that means this has to happen after what year? 1798. Are you catching me? Now, wait a minute. Didn't we just study and read that that's what happened too in Revelation chapter 13? Right? 1798 is when what? The mortal wound happens, so God doesn't need to protect his church anymore from this corruption, from this distortion. Why? Because that wound has been received, and why has it been received? Because this earth has also helped his church. Is everybody catching me? I'm going at, you know, at, a, at a moderate pace, because I know this is a mouthful. It's just a mouthful to talk about it. Are you catching me? Are we looking at it? Don't worry, we're going to review it, and we're going to see how this all breaks down in great detail. And we're going to study the same thing again next week. So watch this. Verse number 16. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, that's the people, nations, tribes, the attacks, the abuses, which the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. Verse 17. And the dragon was what? Enraged with the woman. Why? Because she had fled to the earth. He could not touch her. He could not have control or power over her as he was doing while she was doing in the Roman Empire under Imperial Rome. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of who? Jesus Christ. So this last stage, my loved ones, Revelation 12, 17 tells us that the last stage of the church, because it says the remnant, right? The remnant, that's the last stage of God's people will be persecuted through what? Through the image of the beast. Because that's what it said in Revelation chapter 13. That the wound was going to be healed through the second beast. And what was going to happen? Persecution. If you do not worship, the second beast gives the power back to the first beast. And what does the first beast do? Use it to persecute again. Are you catching me? It's amazing how it's all outlined and broken down in scripture. In such perfect detail. How it all, it, it all, it all uh, what's the word? Help me. It all comes together. It all... Yeah, all of those. Good. <laughs> I didn't hear anything, but that's okay. So, here's where it gets interesting, my loved ones, because putting this together, that means that this second beast, again, was not a beast, became a beast, and then eventually, down the road, this has not happened yet, but it, we're in the process, is going to make an image to the first beast and is going to restore the power. Now, without you noticing, we just extracted a number of characteristics from the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. Watch this. Number one, this land or this earth protects the woman from what? From the snake dragon, from the state church powers that was happening in Europe. Are you catching me? This is all happening in Europe, right? And so this oppression, this attack is all happening, both attack from the within and attack from without. This attack is happening. And so she, number one, she protects from the woman's state. Number two, it said in Revelation, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Let's begin with the word then. We know that then happened when? After 1798, because it says that she received the wound, he was taken into captivity, and then he saw another beast, right? So that means that the second nation rises up after the fall of the first nation. 
And I'm going to actually show you that the second beast rises because of the abuses of the first beast. That's what happens. Coming up, the word coming up in Greek, in, in Revelation, is the word anabaino, which means to grow or flourish as is used in the context of the development of a plant. You can see that in Matthew 13, 7, the word, same word is used. That means that the second beast, contrary to the beast in, Revela in Daniel chapter uh, um, 2 and 7, those beasts were conquering each other, right? This beast doesn't conquer any other beast. He rises up on its own. He grows like a plant. He develops on his own. Notice he does not conquer another beast. And he comes out of the land, right? That word earth is more, is, is better, uh, uh, more, uh, um, is expressed more direct is the land. Comes out of the land, not sea. Because remember, what does the sea represent? People, tribes, nations, and? So if this beast is coming out of the land, are there people, tribes, nations, tongues, monarchies, kingdoms? No, there are people, but it's not developed as in Europe. Are you catching me? Because that's what's happening, what happening in Europe when all of these events are happening. Number three, it says it had two horns like a lamb. Now, what does a lamb represent in Scripture? Christ, right? And a lamb, what type of animal is it? It's a young sheep. Am I talking the same language? It's a young sheep. So, a lamb, this second, this second beast, means it's a young nation that is Christ-like because it has what? Horns like a lamb. So if it's Christ-like, that means it, in some way, shape, or form, it represents Christianity, right? But then it says that it speaks like a dragon. So what we're seeing in this second beast is that it has two faces. It presents a Christ-like feature, but then at the same time, it also speaks like a dragon. Are you catching me? Let's continue. Notice that the horns have no, no crowns. In other words, no what? No monarchs, no kings, right? Look at this. Two horns are kingdoms, separate but equal. Where did we see this concept of the two horns? Remember we were studying in Daniel chapter 8? It said that the ram, how many horns did the ram have? Two. But what was the problem in Daniel chapter 8? One horn was higher than the other. And when we studied it, they looked at the history, it was talking about the Mede and the Persian Empire. And what was the problem with the Mede and the Persian Empire? That at first, this one horn is higher because who's dominating? The Medes. But then as history went through, that kingdom flipped and the Persians took dominance in the Mede and the Persian Empire. Are you catching me? So there was a disbalance in the ram. But on this beast, it's saying that those two horns are what? They're there and they are separate but equal. Are you catching me? There's not one dominating the other. There's a balance between these two horns or these two powers. Now, did Christ recognize two powers on this earth? Yes, he did, my loved ones. He recognized two powers or two kingdoms. Matthew twenty two seventeen. Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are of Caesar's and to God the things that are of God. Did Jesus Christ recognize the political civil authority on earth? Yes, he did. Did he submit to it? Yes, he did. He let them carry out the execution even though they did not have jurisdiction over that, right? They got out of their place because the religious powers sent them to the political powers and the political power says he didn't commit any civil crime. Well, you're accusing him of breaking the first tablet, not the second one. And what happened? Pressure and they succeeded and they did it, right? So there are how many kingdoms? Recognized by Jesus Christ, two kingdoms. The civil, political authorities and who else? From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Who says amen? amen? So what does that mean? These two powers are represented in this Christ-like beast. That means there is what? There is a separation of church and states. Political powers are there and recognized, but so are the religious. And notice one does not dominate the other. There is a balance between these two horns, and they're standing there, but they're not mixing and one is not dominating the other. Are you catching me, my loved ones? So this beast, this young nation that is rising up after the year 1798 is a nation that has separated these two powers and is upholding them and keeping them separate. Is everybody following me? Totally contrary to what's happening in Europe where the political powers are, and the religious powers are trying to dominate each other. This new nation, my loved ones, this is not happening. There's a separation of church and state. Everybody with me? Number three says to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and, and did live. Now, the word says in Greek, very interesting. 
The word says is the Greek lego, which means to ask or persuade. So if this nation is asking or persuading the people that dwell in it to make an image, that means that it's what? It's through democratic principles. It's not forcing it at first. First, it's persuading, right? That's the word. That's what it means. It's asking them to make an image. Then there's type, some type of political discourse, right? There's some type of political dialogue going on. This is a democratic nation. Are you catching me? But then what happens, it's going to force. Start off. Isn't that what happened in Daniel chapter 3? Right? Oh, first start off, dedication, and then boom, bring the hammer. The earth or this land territory during one period protected the woman, the church. But we're seeing in Revelation 13 that it's going to end up what? Rising up against her. So at first this land, this earth, protected the church, right? But prophecy is saying that after a while, that protection is going to be taken away. And she then is going to go against her. Against this religious freedoms, against the church. Is everybody with me? I am going to give you a summary of the present characteristics of this second beast. And if you haven't figured it out by now, you should have. Number one, this nation protected believers that fled religious persecution in Europe. Number two, it becomes a beast or a superpower after the year 1798. That means it's a military, political, economic, cultural, and technological power. It's a young superpower that doesn't conquer another superpower, but grows up and develops slowly. Number four, it grows where there are no people, multitudes, nations, and languages, right? There are people, but there's not multitudes like it was in Europe. It's a nation that is growing slowly. It separates church and state. That means that there's no papacy and no king. Why? Because it learned from the abuses in Europe. And last, it's a Christian nation, has horns like a lamb, with democratic principles because at first it persuades its population to make an image. My loved ones, there is only one nation on this earth that qualifies and that covers all of these characteristics. It's not even close. There's not even one other nation that comes close to all of these principles and all of these things, my loved one. And what nation is that? The United States of America. Now, before you jump up in arms and try to overthrow this presentation, <laughs> let's play it out. Amen? Let's see how this plays out because you're probably thinking, but wait a minute. You're telling me that our nation is going to somehow get involved in this scheme that the Vatican is trying to do? Well, let's begin. This is Charles Kratheimer. He actually died recently. He was a political commentator and a historian. He says, the fact is, talking about the United States of America, there is no country has been as dominant culturally, economically, technologically, and militarily in the history of the world since the Roman Empire. He's talking about us. He says, there's never been a nation since the Roman Empire as the United States of America. Now, let's begin. Characteristics of the second beast of Revelation 13. First, it protects the woman from the what? From the snake dragon, state, church powers in Europe. I have a question. Does that apply to us? Yes. Who left Europe? First came the pilgrims. But everybody that fled Europe, the majority of them were fleeing what? Religious persecution. There were Christians trying to run away from the religious persecution, first under the papacy and then what was happening in different parts of Europe, right? The king of England then tried to dominate the church and he took power, right? Well, again, this imbalance, this struggle between church and state, and that's how this nation was protected, amen? Why? Because God didn't have to protect her anymore, my loved ones, the church, because the church ended up where? Going to this land where there was not a lot of people and having what? Having protection in what way, shape, or form? Here it is, my loved ones. Here are the different stages of Revelation chapter 12. So we have here that the dragon imperial Rome now focuses persecution on the church. This happened between the years 31 and 538. Then the church is protected in the wilderness from papal Rome. If you know the study of Europe, you have groups like the Valdensians, right? And lots of Christians that when they saw what was happening with the church in, in Rome, what did they do? They fled to the mountains because they saw the corruption happening in, inside of the Christian church when, the, when, uh, when Catholicism was rising. And they said, we don't want anything to do with this. And so God took them, his spirit took them out to the wilderness in France and different parts where they can what? They can worship freely. And that's how God protected his word. Amen. 
Because if they were, if it would have stayed in Rome, they would have been completely corrupted. So God took them out during this time period. Number of groups, interesting, fascinating history. And so what happens after that? Then the church does what? The church leaves Europe and comes to where? To this land that gives her protection. Mm, does that sound familiar? If you were not sleeping during your history class, during your whole middle school, high school, and everything, then you would know what was happening. Revelation 12, 16. What stage of the church flees to the earth land from the persecution in Europe? The Protestant church. What is the foundation of this country? It's a Protestant country, right? Protestant foundations fleeing. And so when you look, my loved ones, talking about then they saw another beast coming out of the earth. The United States of America declared its independence in 1776. The Constitution was passed in 1787. The Bill of Rights was adopted in 1791. And we were clearly recognized as a world superpower by the year 1798. So when the papacy loses its power, who's rising up? This second nation is starting to grow. And that second nation is what? The United States of America. Is everybody with me, my loved ones? Amen? You thought prophecy was kind of boring. It's amazing. If you hadn't get caught up to that yet, had two horns like a lamb. A lamb is a young nation, right? A young animal that is Christ-like and represents Christianity. I have a question. Do we have Judeo-Christian foundation? Yes, we do, right? No crowns or hounds. That mean, um, no crowns or horns. That means no monarchs or kings. Do we have kings here in this country? No, we're not playing kings and, and, and dungeons and dragons and all those things, right? We're not doing any of that. Why? Because we know what happened in Europe because of that. Two horns are kingdoms, separate but equal. Jesus Christ recognized the two kingdoms of church and state. I have a question. Is that what happened here? Oh, my loved ones. The founding fathers, my loved ones, as you always hear so much about them, especially in the last couple of weeks with all the impeachment and all that. Founding fathers, my loved ones, were men that came from Europe, the majority of them. And what happens? They said, we do not want to follow in the ways of Europe. We saw what happens when church and state are not separated. We see the abuses. We know what the papacy was doing during those 1,260 years. And so the founding fathers of this nation says, we are not going to commit the same mistake. Amen. We are going to make a different nation, a new nation where church and state are separated. Amen? And so what you have here, my loved ones, is the Declaration of Independence in the year 1776. And look at what it, hold, what it, what it says. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created what? What blasphemy was the, what they thought in England? Why? Because kings didn't think that they were equal. Kings thought they were gods. And they had this divine lineage that they followed. And the peasants, the people on the bottom, right? There's no equality. This is revolutionary, my loved ones. That all people are created equal. That's mind-blowing. Now it's like, yeah, of course, why not? Not back in those days. Over in Europe and the rest of the world, like, what's wrong with these Americans? Are they crazy? 